Okay, so thanks everybody and welcome back. We resume the session and the last session of the day. So this is the regional and sectoral information outreach lab. This is Nada Cloud, the Nada Code, <laughs> that is an expert in outreach and science dissemination. She was also working with us uh, during the um, IPCC and give, uh, giving us a lot of uh, useful hint for dissemination and uh, also how to speak and, and present our uh, result. So during the lab, there will be two, three people online, not two, two and plus Nada, so three talks. And maybe Sarah, you will give uh, the information about the application later at the end. Yes, so because they were asking online the people about the information too. So, okay, so then I leave first the word to Nada and then. Uh, no, because it's not working. Do, do you hear now me? it's working. So, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Nada Ko, um, outreach manager. Oh. Yes, yeah, so I'm a communications manager at. Uh, Climate Research Lab, LEC at IPSL. And I worked as the outreach manager for Working Group One uh, for two years in 2021 and 2022. And we developed a new uh, outreach product, regional and sectoral fact sheets. So I, I will present uh, what we have done, our audience, uh, the content that we wanted to highlight. And uh, so as it's for the Working Group One, we focused on the physical climate uh, variables. And uh, during the two next um, talks, uh, the colleagues from working group three and two will present their own fact sheets about mitigation and uh, adaptation uh, and impacts. And then uh, Sarah will present uh, two other new products, uh, summary for actuaries and the summary for all. So um, which audience? We actually, the audience that we, targeted. Uh, so we have several audiences. Uh, first of all, the high level policymakers and stakeholders. Um, so they don't have a lot of time, they need very brief and robust notes, and they may uh, have no scientific background. So we need to avoid jargon. Another audience is uh, the practitioners and engineers in companies and um, in climate services, for instance. So they need more technical information and uh, uh, sometimes they need to access um, they need to access to the physical climate data to run their own impact models, for instance. And uh, we have also the scientists from academia who need also to access the data and to the literature. So to know um, this audience, we conducted several surveys. Uh, so this, uh, these are some results of one of the surveys um, we conducted before uh, preparing the sectoral fact sheets. So we had almost 400 participants, um, more or less 30% from the public sector, uh, including 20, more or less 20% from governments. We had 21% um, from private sector, 8% cons from consultancy, 9% from NGOs, and 40% from research. And um, more than 180 provided their emails to be contacted for further consultations. So we invited them at several steps of the um, co-design of this, those uh, fact sheets to, to get their feedback. So during this uh, survey, we asked them about their needs in terms of climate information, climate data. Um, so we have uh, in our assessment report, the list of CIDs that are relevant per sector based on the um, literature, but we also asked those participants to select uh, the CIDs that they find relevant. Uh, so we asked also about the preferred time and special scale, uh, which um, scenarios do they prefer, uh, climate statistics, etc. And um, so the panel that we had, the 391 participants, were interested in all the sectors and represented all the regions. Uh, so here are very brief uh, results. I don't show um, 
everything because otherwise it would be too long. So they preferred slightly uh, the, to present the information by global warming levels, uh, then by time horizon, and then by SSPs. Uh, for the time scale of interest, the near term was the most preferred one. Um, for the so we asked also about the statistics. Uh, they were interested in both mean values and extreme values. Uh, they, most of them needed the information about uncertainty. And we asked also some questions about how do they want it to, uh, the information to be presented in two, page, in two pages. Um, so most of them preferred the bullet points instead of paragraphs. Uh, and um, they wanted maps, figures, and uh, also tables. So which contents? Uh, we, so usually uh, the users focus mainly on the summary for policymakers, which is uh, very good, but we want them to dig further and to, to read the information that is uh, available in the technical summary and the report uh, that could be useful for their region or for their sector. For instance, uh, um, we have this uh, table uh, in the technical summary. Uh, Erika, you showed uh, a similar table in chapter 12 where we have CIDs per uh, region and per subregion. Um, we have the observation, the projections, the attribution, the confidence level, etc. We have uh, this table in chapter 12 that represents, that you showed as well, that represents the CIDs that are relevant per sectors. So the challenge was to select information in only two pages to guide the users uh, through the, um, oops, I want to, yes. So from the SPM to the technical summary, to the chapters, to the, 40,000 publications that were used to the assessment to, to help them find the information. And also we wanted to highlight the interactive atlas, which is a wonderful tool to visualize the data. Um, so to do this, we wanted to have a co-construction cool process and to be inclusive and um, to, to make a large consultation. So. A lot of authors participated, colleagues from the technical support unit and the, the, the bureau as well. So working closely with them uh, was important to ensure accuracy and robustness, to ensure the traceability to the report. So some of them are here in the room, so I thank them because it was really precious um, to have uh, their contributions. We also, had a lot of interaction with the stakeholders and practitioners. So we organized several surveys to check the usefulness and the relevance of the information uh, that we selected uh, to check the clarity. We organized meetings um, with them per sector um, at different stages of the development of the fact sheets. And we had several meetings with colleagues from working group two and three to check the consistency across the working groups. And we had to make some editorial choices to, to get an harmonized set of fact sheets so that the users um, grab the, um, the coherence and the, to, so that they find the same information at the same place, but with some flexibility because um, to, to respect uh, the specificities of each fact sheet. So uh, I will show very briefly on the website. Oops. Where, what do we can find? So you can find on this link, the regional factory. So if I show the one um, dedicated to Africa. So we decided to present first the um, information that is um, the same for the whole region, for the whole Africa. So these are um, mostly high confidence statements. And then we decided to present um, several maps 
for three global warming levels. And the flexibility was up to each region to select four variables that were the most relevant. We made links to the interactive atlas. So if you select one of the maps and you click on it, so you will open the interactive atlas with the good parameters, and then you can select um, another scenario or um, to get a specific subregion to, to have more information. And uh, so tomorrow, um, Mayaline and uh, Lina will show uh, more in details the interactive atlas and uh, you will uh, play with, uh, with it. But you can also have information about the data, et cetera. So these are some functionalities that you could um, see tomorrow. And so, yeah, so if I come back. So this is the first page of the regional fact sheet. So you can have the links for further details in the technical summary and the chapters um, to, to get more uh, information. And uh, on the second page, we, we, had, uh, we have boxes per subregion with the, the two, three, or four main regional information for each subregion. And uh, we have, so for the regional fact sheets, the continents, but also some specific topologies like uh, mountains, oceans, small islands, re polar region, urban areas, etc. And you can also find the list of contributors if you want to get the, the names of the specialists who participated um, in this uh, development of the fact sheets. And below you can find the fact sheets that are relevant for sectors. So here we don't talk about impacts, about the sector um, impacts um, for the sectors or the um, mitigation. We focus on the climatic variables that are relevant. And, um, but we provide the chapters in working group two and three, if you want to get more information. And uh, we have the same principle of pointing to the interactive atlas. So here you have this uh, representation that provides several information about several CIDs that can be expanded in the interactive atlas. And, uh, and of course, we have the, the information about where to find more details to to complement uh, the information. So that's it from my side. I, so if you have uh, any question or uh, information, uh, if you want to, I don't know if you have already used the, the regional fact sheets or the sectoral fact sheets, if you have any comments. Comments, feedbacks? One at a time. I just want to augment a little bit. I In doing the sectoral uh, fact sheets, I think one of the things that was very fascinating was, um, so wait, which one, which one do you have on the screen here? Oh, good. It's agriculture. That's one I helped with. So in the, in the upper right there, you'll see something that, you know, came from the interactive CID, um, you know, part of the interactive atlas CID. And one of the fascinating things about doing that was selecting which CIDs we wanted to show. And in that sense, the interactive atlas is pre uh, programmed to allow up to six different CIDs to be shown in this presentation. Um, so it was a very fascinating process to say, okay, if I can only show six CIDs to give agricultural people an idea of what's happening in the world, what would they be? And I have to squint my eyes to remember exactly which ones I showed, but it's listed right there underneath the hexagon. Um, and it's going to be, you know, combinations of temperature and rainfall and aridity or, or drought probably. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that we talked about carbon dioxide. So uh, we have them here. There you go. Can you, can you read them out to me? What, yes. It's the ones it's, it's the, the key is on the left where the colored yeah. hexagon is. Yeah. So we have mean surface temperature, frost, mean precipitation, agricultural, ecological drought and relative sea level, atmospheric CO2 at surface. Yeah. So these are the, the types of things that, you know, if you want to know how agriculture is being affected in different parts of the world, 
this gives you a rundown. So you'll notice that there's, you know, some hot, some cold, some dry, some wet, you know, coastal uh, flooding, you know, things like that. We're trying to, to understand more, but it's an interesting exercise. If you, if you could only show a certain number to your stakeholders, what would you show? Thank you, Alex. Okay. So otherwise I give the floor to the next talk. I don't know if someone online would like to ask a question. Otherwise I will give the floor to my colleague from working group three, uh, Sigi. Thanks, Nala. Uh, Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I just, you? sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to make sure you could share your screen. Uh, yeah, I'm going to share my screen here shortly. I'm just going to get the right application. Are you able to see that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, cool. Hi, lovely to meet you all. Um, my name is Sigourney Luz. Uh, you can call me Siggy. Um, I was previously the comms manager for Working Group 3, the Climate Mitigation Working Group at IPCC. Uh, so I was heavily involved with developing the sectoral fact sheets on behalf of Working Group 3, as well as a colleague of mine who's actually um, on the call here uh, virtually, uh, and that's Apruva Hasija, who was the IPCC Working Group 3 Publications Manager. Uh, we've both moved on to different jobs, but uh, we remember the fact sheets very fondly. Um, I'll try and go through this presentation relatively swiftly because I know that we're a little behind. Um, but just as some background, the, the, work, the Working Group 3 fact sheets were always intended to be sectoral fact sheets based on the structure of our report. And they were the main outreach product for Working Group 3 in this assessment cycle, at least for the, um, for the sixth assessment report. Uh, aside from some, some other outreach that we did and some other products that were produced through the secretariat with the, um, the video editor or one of the comm specialists there. So this was sort of our big project for, um, for working group three. So as, as some background, why did we choose to do sectoral fact sheets? I think it's relatively straightforward, actually, the reasoning behind it. The Working Group 3 report, if you're familiar with it, which I'm sure many of you are, um, is structured around the uh, sectoral chapters. It has the initial chapters of the report focus on um, the sort of uh, history of, uh, of emissions, of greenhouse gas emissions. There is a number of chapters that focus on the mitigation pathways and looking forwards. There's then a whole section um, in the middle of the report, the bulk of the middle of the report that's focused on different sectors and mitigation options within those sectors, as well as other um, uh, important points on not just about mitigation, but um, previous emissions from within, from within a sector and linkages with other parts of the report, as well as the other working groups. And then finally, at the end of the report, there is a section on uh, things like international cooperation uh, and policy linkages, for example. Um, so as part of communicating the Working Group 3 report, we actually saw the, the sectors as a really important and easy way to do this. Um, in terms of other parts of the report, we didn't get to cover the mitigation pathway section, and that's where a lot of the attention of the Working Group 3 report already exists. So when we released the report, there was significant interest in that topic from the media, as well as civil society uh, and the general public. And so we wanted to focus um, not just on that, but also on the other important parts and the practical options that are within the report, the mitigation options that are available now um, and you know where, where further action is needed. So that's a bit of background on why we chose the the fact sheets. Um, and in terms of the, the audience for the Working Group 3 report as well, I mean, Nada mentioned helpfully already that policymakers are a key audience for IPCC. For Working Group 3, that also means policymakers working within particular areas. So within particular sectors, they might be working in cities, um, they might be helping to develop city plans, or they may be city planners themselves. Uh, basically, across all the different sectors, there are different types of policymakers, but also in business. Uh, and it's not just policymakers who read the, the reports that IPCC produces, although we do focus the SPM for policymakers, it is other groups as well. So we wanted to consider that when we developed these fact sheets. Uh, and then we also have significant requests for outreach products uh, and information based on the sectors as well. So in total, we prepared eight fact sheets. Um, some of them are on screen here. These are the 
you can you can see that although they're based around the sectors, one of our sectors is called demand, uh, which looks at the um, demand side mitigation options and social aspects of mitigating climate change. And that was still an important topic that we wanted to cover, even though it was not technically a sector. Um, so those are the first four. And then here are the other four as well. And I mentioned why we haven't done mitigation pathways yet, but I think that's something that could be considered for future outreach products, um, maybe by someone else working within the IPCC or even for the next assessment cycle as well, because they're really complex and there's a lot of interest in them. Uh, but luckily we have some fantastic graphics already around the mitigation pathways that are in the reports. Uh, so there's a lot of outreach that already happens around those. In terms of developing the fact sheets, this kind of goes along with what Nada was saying or a similar structure. We wanted to make sure that we were covering both the, the style side and the content side in terms of producing appealing fact sheets that people would want to look at. So they had to be engaging and, and enjoyable to look at. And you'll see that they're very, very different to the way that uh, IPCC products are typically produced. They follow our branding guidelines, but they don't look like a report. Uh, you, can, you could pull it out and you could read it by itself and hopefully understand majority of what's in the fact sheet without needing to have background on the report. Uh, we wanted them to be useful for more practical reasons. We wanted to be able to repurpose the material for social media, for presentations, to be able to pull bits out and visually represent key messages from the report. Uh, so that's one reason uh, why we've developed them in the way we have. And then we also wanted consistency across the fact sheet. So if you read one, you would understand the structure and be able to read the next one in a similar sort of manner. So you'll see that there are consistent um, content across the fact sheets as well as uh, the type of style that we've used and the, the sort of tones that we've used and some of the, the imagery and visuals as well. In terms of getting the content together, um, this was this was tricky because we we had to pull it out of the chapters themselves. You know, the, the IPCC reports, each chapter is many pages in length. Um, so we had to distill the messages from each chapter. And that really helped us to identify the structure for the fact sheets and the common elements across the chapters, as well as what was different and where we needed to build in, um, you know, design changes for, for each chapter on the fact sheet. Um, and then we also wanted to have a, have a clear narrative for each fact sheet on uh, where the emissions are coming from and what the mitigation options are. And that's re reflected in, in the fact sheet, which I'm going to break down here in a sec. If you'd like to download them, they're, uh, they're on the Working Group 3 microsite and the link is there. So this is the buildings fact sheet. So just as an example, we highlighted a key message from each, uh, from each chapter so that you could sort of get the, the big picture in one sentence or two sentences is probably more appropriate. Uh, and then we had sort of a background on what the share of um, emissions was for that sector and what it would look like in terms of getting to net zero or what the sub message was for the chapter. So, for example, for the um, for the cities and urban areas chapter, that was actually different. It wasn't about getting to net zero emissions in cities. It was more a suite of options. So really, it depended on on the chapter and what the content was. And then below that, we have uh, the mitigation options. And there's there's a visual representation of what those mitigation options are because we wanted to present a cohesive um, um, picture that these things work together. So yeah, so this is probably one of the more uh, appealing parts of the fact sheet. And I think it really nicely demonstrates the different aspects that work together. And you can see at the top there, for this fact sheet in particular, we've actually demonstrated options in, in buildings from the design stage to the disposal stage. So it actually reflects the content of the, the report. It doesn't just fill these sort of um, structured boxes that you know is, doesn't work for a scientific report. And then on the reverse side, we had some, some mitigation options that just don't fit in, that happens. Um, but we also have across the chapters, typically some common factors around what enables um, certain mitigation factors to be, in mitigation options to be implemented, as well as things that are preventing those uh, options from being implemented. And we, we explore those on the back of the fact sheet. And then finally, importantly, we have the linkages to other parts of the report, as well as to the working group two report. So uh, many of the mitigation options had crossovers in terms of delivering benefits in terms of adaptation as well. So we wanted to highlight those on the, on the fact sheet. In terms of the preparation process, um, I sort of talked a bit about this already. We did a review of the, of the chapters to identify the common elements, and then we received um, some feedback from stakeholders, uh, business stakeholders from the International Chamber of Commerce. So we released a, an internal 
survey to their membership base who provided feedback. And these were typically people like chief sustainability officers, uh, people working within corporates, helping to work on mitigation, their mitigation pathways and their decarbonization strategies. So they were familiar um, with the IPCC reports, um, but perhaps they were trying to communicate what, what the options were internally, as well as just um, learning about this information themselves so there's there's that factor to consider as well and that helped us to determine the sort of tone and style of the fact sheets as well as what we would cover in them so we did pose those questions to them i haven't included details here because it's very uh it's very detailed um, but if you have questions about that um, you can email me or or approve and then finally we had to find skilled designers graphic designers who could work with really complex content and were really comfortable and motivated to prepare visuals that reflected the feedback of the IPCC and its many authors who were involved in this process, because having accurate visuals that don't misrepresent a topic or a sector or a mitigation option is really important. In terms of the preparation, uh, we pulled those, those key messages out to fit within the sort of structure that we had decided on based on the stakeholder feedback. And our initial drafts are really long, many pages in length, um, but we spent a lot of time, Apurva and I, uh, shortening them to make them uh, digestible. And then we went through a mood boarding stage with the graphic designers to sort of identify what color options would be appealing and in line with the VCMI branding, as well as what kind of visual elements um, were best represented each particular topic and how they worked together to develop these things like environments, as you can see at the bottom of the demand fact sheet. So the, the, the section at the bottom was easily the hardest to develop because it was it had more um, interlocking parts and required more feedback and um, sort of identifying what would be an accurate representation for the chapter, I suppose is the best way to put it. Uh, we didn't want to make any little mistakes and, um, you know, the reports, the SPM is approved line by line. So it's important that the, the, the fact sheets itself reflect what is, what is signed off in the report. Uh, and then finally, we provided some design prompts to the graphics team to make sure that, you know, it reflected that intention and those messages. Uh, in terms of how we prepared them, they were reviewed by all of the authors. Um, the TSU, the Technical Support Unit in the IPCC Working Group 3, reviewed them for clarity and um, the, uh, clarity in terms of the visuals and the text as well. Uh, and a lot of the intricacies and um, language issues were picked up by the authors. And that was an essential part of reviewing the fact sheets is having the authors review them and look at them and make sure that they're, they're okay for public consumption. And then finally, in terms of distribution, uh, we actually launched them at COP26 in Egypt. Uh, we had printed copies, but a very limited amount uh, because we don't need to print off too much stuff now. We have the internet, um, but they were helpful for a lot of the, the, the events that we ran and they supported a lot of the sectoral events at COP. Uh, they were picked up by a real wide variety of people um, and they're now housed on the working group three website which you can sorry microsite which you can take a look at if you're interested and we distributed them as well um, through our newsletter in terms of the distribution of these i think the the picture on the right is from twitter and that kind of reflects what we were really trying to achieve which is digestible content that reflects the messages of the report without just writing text on a on a, on a tweet which is you know pretty typical of a lot of the report content that we um that we share in terms of what we learned for next time, this was a really long process and we would probably aim to build in more review time uh, if we can. Uh, we also found that um, having the, the design inputs and the final version of the, the copy, the text and the inputs, uh, the information that we're giving to the designers was really important to have in as final a version as possible to avoid confusion. So that's more, for, that's more a process, um, lessons learned. And then something else that we might consider, which we didn't get around to achieving is considering the interactive aspects. Would we want to animate some of these in future, which could make even better um, you know, social media content or shareable content? Um, and would we like to make the PDFs interactive it's one step we didn't quite get to but if we'd inbuilt it it might have been more achievable and then finally surveying more audiences i know that nada did this um, with a bunch of the with the policy makers and i think that's something that we would look into doing next time if we were to do it again i say we but i don't work for the ipcc anymore so the next working group three people <laughs> and that's it from me thank you so much um, if you have questions just uh, shoot us an email or find us on linkedin thanks Thank you very much, uh, Siki. It was uh, very interesting. Are there questions? And, and the, yes. Oh. 
Okay, thank you for your presentation. I would like to know what the difference between the fact sheet that you produce and the policy brief. And in that specific case, did you also produce policy brief as communication material? Thank you. Thank you, should I go ahead and answer? Thank you for your question. Um, I would say that this is quite different to a policy brief. It may contain some of the same content, but typically a policy brief is written for a group of policymakers that have a particular interest. So IPCC as an organi as a, as a um, intergovernmental organization works within the UNFCCC process, which means majority of the formal presentations that we give are to the national level policymaking teams. So those are through, you know, the official routes like the COP um, and the Substa where, we, where we're invited to present the content of the report. So maybe that would be, the content of those would be closer to a policy brief and you can find those, those presentations on the UNFCCC website. They're very difficult to find. So if you can't find them, let me know. Um, and in terms of the more sort of national level policymakers, I know that many of the authors do outreach with national level policymakers and are required to write policy briefs um, based on their personal experience as academics in their field, but also from the perspective of being an IPCC author and they'll have to pull content out from these reports. So they may use content that would would cross over with the fact sheets. I don't think they're quite detailed enough to to be considered a policy brief. So for example, if you were speaking to a city level um, policymaker or a city planner or a group of city planners, you would probably need to pull out information that is more uh, relevant to that group and their national or local circumstances and what they're looking to do. So one thing we did in, in this assessment cycle is provide some training to, to the authors across all of the working groups on engaging with policymakers so that they could, to, they could write those policy briefs. But in terms of writing them ourselves within the working groups, the TSUs don't do that or haven't done that before. Yeah, I hope that's helpful. Thanks, Sigi. We have another question in the room. Yes. Uh, hi, I want to know if uh, these fact sheets are only in English or if they are in other languages also. That is an excellent question. Currently, the fact sheets are only in English. I think it would be certainly possible to have them translated into the official UN languages. Um, and it's something that we were looking at doing. Unfortunately, one of the one of the things that happens when IPCC cycles end is the technical support unit disappears um, from one cycle to the next. So there's not actually anyone to carry over that work, uh, but it's certainly feedback that I can provide to the secretariat if there's interest. I know for the working group on fact sheets, there are some non-official translations in French, for instance, but uh, the translations need it's a lot of approval by the authors, the co-chairs, etc. Yeah, the translations take a long time to be approved because the people who have the expertise to approve them are incredibly busy already. Uh, so if they're coming, they will take a while to, to arrive. And actually, it's a new product, so it wasn't um, planned to, to translate them. So maybe next cycle, if it's included in the official products. We have a question on the um, online. Can the fact sheet be used as a tool for prescription of strategies for climate sustainability? I guess it's for you. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the fact sheets are prescribing what to do to achieve climate sustainability. I think they're providing options for the uh, that policymakers and that businesses can consider. They provide a holistic sort of overview of the working group three report I think in terms of developing the strategies and the policies and the actions themselves they probably require a bit more consideration but it gives you a good idea of what is out there and what is available that's what that's what I would say about it yeah actually it's a, an entry point to the report so we highlight main messages either by region or by sector and then we invite uh, the users to dig further are there more questions or should we move to the next talk? Thank you very much, Sigi. So Camilla, the floor is yours. Hi. 
Hi, everyone, and thanks for the introduction, Nada. Um, it's a pleasure to be joining you. I'm Camilla Nabiva. I was working as a communications manager with the working group two of the IPCC, and I'll give you a short presentation about our fact sheets. Um, as soon as I find a way to share my presentation. So here it is. Can you see it well? Um, I don't hear. Yes, um, we see it. OK, great. Thanks. Um, so yes, um, I will not be speaking that much about the process uh, of designing our fact sheets because in many ways it was um, similar to the processes that were presented by the working group one and working group uh, three, uh, but they didn't involve um, extensive surveys or focal points, um, but we benefited a lot uh, from the uh, results of the service and focal, focal points that the working group one did. Um, so uh, what I will show you um, in my short presentation is uh, what kind of fact sheets you can find, um, uh, what structure and content, um, our target audience, and I'll share you a couple of examples um, from our fact sheets. So just a, um, as a quick introduction, the working group two um, uh, assesses the impacts of climate change on ecosystems, biodiversity, and human communities, and assesses also vulnerabilities and capacities um, of the natural world and uh, human societies to um, adapt to climate change. Our fact sheets um, were designed as also as an outreach product, just um, as it was the case in the working group one and working group three. Um, and it is fully traceable to the um, working group two report on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. Um, as we designed um, the fact sheets, um, we decided to focus on non-scientific audience, um, which is policymakers, practitioners, civil society, media and education representatives. Um, but uh, we figured out um, uh, based on the feedback that we received later that it was actually uh, that fact sheets were actually very useful also for scientific audiences and um, our authors are using them a lot um, uh, teaching students and young scientists uh, find them extremely helpful um, the idea of the fact sheets is to give an easy access to the key findings um, distilled from the relevant chapters cross chapter papers um, technical summary and the global to regional Atlas. So um, we had the same challenge um, that mentioned by my colleagues already that um, the report of the working group two uh, was reviewing about 34,000 scientific papers. It has a, about 3000 pages. Um, so we wanted to make sure that um, there is a product that gives a, a, a very easy access and a snapshot of um, the key findings. Um, to particular topics. Um, we also decided to make them very short, two to three pages, and focus on about 10 key messages or key findings um, um, for each fact sheet. Um, and uh, in terms of structure, they follow the um, narrative of the summary for policymakers. Mm, they do have the same three segments, um, which include climate change impacts and risks, um, adaptation options and barriers, and uh, climate resilient development, uh, which is a, a concept uh, which the working group two um, is examining and assessing in detail um, in the report. Um, I've mentioned that the uh, um, fact sheets um, were distilled uh, from, uh, from the report and we launched uh, most of them before uh, um, or during the approval session together, not, not during, but after following the approval session together with the final approved report. And um, after the co copy editing and uh, publication, um, we've um, 
reviewed fact sheets and um, uh, so some of these statements were um, brought in line with the um, SPMs. So it's actually, um, it's taking the verbatim text, uh, it's pretty much identical to the text um, in the finally approved uh, and copy edited um, report. Um, this slide shows you where you can find it. So if you go um, all mini, uh, all three mini slides of, of the uh, IPCC six assessment report um, are actually pretty identical. So if you go to the mini slide of our working group um, two report, uh, you can find it under about, or if you sc uh, scroll down, you can find it here. Um, and this slide shows you the list of uh, the fact sheets that you can find there. So we've produced um, altogether 14 um, fact sheets. Um, uh, on the website, you can find an introduction, uh, which I highly rec recommend to read before reading the fact sheets because it gives you a very useful information on what kind of um, uh, information can be found uh, in the fact sheets and introduces the uh, key concepts and terms um, that the report deals with. And you can also find the list of contributors, um, the authors and reviewers that were involved in, in the process. Um, the working group two um, launched two sets um, of the reports uh, of the fact sheets, sorry. Um, one set um, is uh, regional fact sheets um, those are seven fact sheets that are based on the regional chapters of the Working Group 2 report, and they include Africa, Asia, Australasia, Central and South America, Europe, North America, and small islands. And we also produced cross-cutting fact sheets, um, which do not stem from uh, uh, um, chapters with similar names, but rather span over different uh, chapters and cross-chapter papers, some of the concepts and topics um, that are relevant, um, such as human settlements, biodiversity, mountains, food and water, and health. Um, now, let me show you a couple of examples of information that can be found there. Um, so this is the introduction um, fact sheet. As I said, it introduces um, the regions that we're dealing with, uh, the process of the, uh, how the fact sheets were um, prepared. It shows you um, the references and how you can work with the references um, in uh, the fact sheets. Some of the key terms and definitions from our glossary, which is the terms that come up very often um, in the report itself um, and in the fact sheet, such as climate resilient development, adaptation limits, vulnerability. Um, and we also present um, very briefly some of the uh, key scenarios um, that uh, we are dealing with, such as RCPs and SSPs. Um, this slide shows you an example of a regional fact sheet, in this case, that's Central and South America. Um, as you can see, um, it has three main elements um, <clears throat> that follow the SPM uh, narrative, that is climate change impacts and risks, adaptation options and barriers, and climate and resilient development. Um, we also wanted, uh, so, uh, so our fact sheet is something um, uh, that should give you, um, a, as I said, very easy access. That's why we try to also use uh, icons and make sure that topics that a practitioner or uh, a civil society representative or a journalist is looking for can easily find. And that's why we used icons and subtopics such as ecosystems, water, food and agriculture uh, in each um, of the fact sheets that makes it easier to navigate um, the information that is presented there. And um, this slide shows you an example of a cross-cutting fact sheet. Um, it also has three main elements that I mentioned before, um, but subtitles are different here, uh, just um, because as I said, um, the fact sheet is not based on one uh, chapter. 
but it actually um, uses information that is mentioned in different chapters and uh, cross chapter papers and pulls out the uh, key information and key findings. Um, okay, and that's the last slide. Um, that um, you can find more information, of course, on the mini side that I, I showed you before. Um, as I'm not working for the um, IPCC anymore, um, I'm happy to answer questions now, but I guess if you have some follow-up questions, um, it's uh, better to contact the technical support unit or the comms department um, of the working group to, um, to ask questions. Um, but I'm here to answer them. Yeah. Thank you very much, Camilla. So, uh, yes. So we have the floor, Monday as yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, it's afternoon here in Nigeria. I don't know if I'm audible. Yes, you are. Okay. Thank you very much. Please, I'm looking at it uh, this way. Um, if I uh, want could uh, maybe want to prepare a fact sheet for maybe a, a short uh, presentation for the government, if one is being asked to do that, I, will it be preferable to pick up the conclusion and uh, then expand it with some key points in the body of the project and, and present it that way? Could that go for it? I'm not sure I got your question. Um, so, you want to prepare a fact sheet based on the um, IPCC fact sheets, or is it a general question about a fact sheet? Okay, it's it's a general question about the fact sheet, not not IPCC fact sheet. Uh, yeah. So so uh, what I was trying to say is that if if one is being asked maybe uh, to get a, a fact sheet prepared for maybe like a a, a presentation for a, for for government uh, to implement a policy. Can one just pick up a conclusion from a project and expand that, including the key points from the paper? Can that go? <laughs> That's a good question, but I think uh, I'm a wrong person to answer it. Um, I think in this case, you should um, really uh, think of the target audience, which is in your case, policymakers, and then consider what exactly you want to achieve. And then um, with this fact sheet and either ask them before um, uh, or uh, depending on what you want to achieve just to make um, uh, make it to give it a try and um, implement it the way you want to do it and then uh, show it and see if it works. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there other questions in the room or online? Yeah, Alex, let's go ahead. Maybe just as a, as a follow-up, have you been able to track these fact sheets and see if they're being downloaded or if, you know, uh, if they're on bulletin boards at universities or anything like that, any any it goes across all the working groups. Have have you been able to measure their success? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I'm not sure that we do have such statistics. Um, I would have to double check with colleagues because, um, as I said, I'm not working uh, for the IPCC anymore. Uh, but I know uh, of the um, oral uh, positive feedback from our authors and from the uh, partner organizations uh, that we've been working with. But in terms of the statistics, that would be a, um, a, good, um, a good thing to look into. The same for working group one, we had some feedback, oral feedback, but we didn't uh, conduct surveys but we can ask uh, maybe the colleagues from the IT to provide us the attendance figures for each page of the, the reports and see uh, how many person attended those, our fact sheets pages. Uh, there's another question. I have seen a hand, no? Okay, okay so, so thank you very much, uh, Camila and Sigi. 
we can give the floor to Sarah, who will present other new products. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Is it okay? Can on online people hear me okay? Uh, Yes, great, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just put this on full screen. So I, I realize I'm the last talk before you guys get to go home this evening. So I'll try and not be super long <laughs> and hopefully it will be a bit engaging for you as well. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm gonna talk not about fact sheets, but I wanted to highlight a couple of new summaries that we did in this cycle, which were tailored to specific audiences. And I thought it would be nice to kind of present it to you like um, some lessons learned from my perspective and hopefully give you some tips and guidelines if you want to develop. Uh, well, if you're ever trying to summarize your, your research or your work to non-academic and, and things you can think about when um, when trying to do that. So uh, this is just showing the the reports that came out from the sixth assessment cycle, and um, the two summaries that I'm going to show you is is just focused on the working group one report. So that's the physical science basis, the you know the sea level rise, the extreme uh, extreme events, um, you know human attribution global temperature, these kinds of uh, parts of climate change. And so here's the front covers of the two reports. So the, the two summaries we that I was helping with were the summary for actuaries. So these are like the insurance industry, the reinsurance industry. Um, they are particularly interested in uh, things that cause damage and might affect how they have to evaluate insurances, um, like links to like costs and um, these kinds of aspects. And then there is the climate change summary for all, where we tried to do this aimed at non-scientists. So people who would be interested in climate change, but uh, do not have like necessarily a scientific background. Um, and so, oh, Monday, I think you have your uh, microphone on. Is it possible to mute yourself? No, oh, I can do it. Sorry, Monday. <laughs> um, okay, sorry about that. So now, so from my my experiences of doing this, my tips for you when you're wanting to communicate your research is, um, so we were talking a lot about knowing your audience, understanding your audience. I would actually say, if you can, don't just know your audience, like actually design um some way to ask them questions and get feedback because that's really valuable for under for you to be able to understand what they're understanding um what they find really interesting um yeah and they might want to know more details about specific things if you're planning um to do a like a summary of your research or trying to present it to someone who may not be in your research field um I would also suggest if it's a written uh, written document to try and in include iterations or reviews of your document and um, getting your audience to be able to provide feedback in that review um, because it can be really enlightening and it will definitely enhance your final product. It will be better if you can get them to give you feedback than if you have not been able to, to ask them for feedback. And I would also suggest that you have a mixture of both uh, text communication and uh, display of your, uh, your key messages and visuals, because people have different 
learners. You can have visual learners, you can have people who just prefer reading and understanding. Some people will purely take um, messages just from visuals. So it's it's really good to have like a complementary show of, um, of your results in that sense. And so I'm gonna go through the three tips and just apply them to the two um, summary examples that we, uh, that I was talking about, the summary for actuaries and the summary for all. Summary for actuaries is always in the top left and summary for all is always in the bottom, right? So for the summary for actuaries, the IPCC got in contact with um, an actuarial association. So they're an international, the International Association of the Association of Actuaries, which is a ridiculous name, but it's because they are an international group uh, organization that links to national association of, of actuaries. So they are international, but linked to national ones. So there's, there's loads of different national level actuary associations, and they have this sort of network that covers across many different regions of the world. So strategically, it's a really good organization to engage with because they can disseminate products very widely over a different, um, to different regions. Um, so fortunately, they got in contact with us and we, we decided to do this uh, project with them um, together. And then for the summary for all, um, we just wanted to, uh, we wanted to, uh, talk to audiences that are, are interested in science and, and interested in climate change, but don't necessarily have the training. Um, and this came about because we were talking to members uh, in our technical support unit from the operations side. So our incredible, well-organized uh, human beings that completely make the process run smoothly, but don't necessarily have information and training about about science and at the end of the process of working about five years with these people some of them were saying we don't actually understand what you're talking about <laughs> and it was a bit of an eye-opener for me to be like well I thought I communicated quite well but if people who I'm working with who work in climate change don't still don't understand some of the key messages then we need to think of a way to help help them understand. So um, it, we wanted to make sure we could develop something together with them to make it e easier to understand. Um, so when it comes to reviewing, and if you can get people you know, or like the or people who you know that are in your audience to give you feedback, it will it will really improve your your documents. So I've got a couple of we did. Um, I think it was two reviews for for both of the the summaries. Um, and so we've got some quotes from some of the reviewers from the summary for actuaries on the left and a quote from someone, uh, my cousin, from the summary for all on the right. And so we found that for the summary for actuaries, they were really, um, they need to know a lot more about like definitions. We were taking it for granted that we knew, they, we thought they, we, uh, we thought they understood our terminology, our vocabulary. And we realized actually through this review, we were speaking very different languages and we were using technical acronyms, jargon, that they were like, well, what do you mean by that? Define what that is. And, and after one of the reviews, we, we decided to put in a glossary to try and help them <laughs> understand. Um, there was also, it was a really good opportunity for them to say, this bit we're really interested in. Can you tell us more? Do you have more data on this? And this bit, okay, but it's not it's not the priority for us. And so we were able to then like change the like the over the overview of the and like the distribution of the information for the summary for, for actuaries. So we tailored it and we made it more useful for them to use, which is good for us because it means they're gonna disseminate it and and tell the people tell the their their networks about the IPCC more. And then for the summary for all, uh, we really wanted to do an open call to get uh, more, more people involved, but we, we ended up not having enough time. So we, we just basically tried to find friends and family members that were not scientists who we knew would give us honest feedback. And this is an example from my cousin that shows it, if you, you will definitely get feedback from people <laughs> who love you and um, you know people who are like teenagers, for example. So my, friend, my cousin said, to be honest, if I hadn't committed you uh, committed to you that I would read and provide feedback, I'm not sure I would have got past the first page. So that helped give me a, <laughs> a good um, rethink <laughs> about how we should communicate the, the, the product. Um, so I really, really recommend um, having some kind of like review or, or a chance to have feedback. And in terms of um, how you communicate your, your, uh, your key messages, um, using a mixture of text and visuals can be very useful. 
this is an example of some of the figures and tables that are in the summary for actuaries. You can see here that there are a variety of, of uh, figures. So the one on the, the left is actually from the summary for policymakers. Um, they found it very useful because it was talking about um, extreme weather events and how often they occur at one, 1 1.5 degrees warming, two degrees warming. So they were really interested in this sort of probability extreme weather event kind of information. But then they actually wanted a lot more detailed and information that wasn't necessarily in the summary for policymakers. So then we started digging out information from other parts of the report that was specifically useful for them. Um, and so we have this table, actually, um, Nada showed this a bit, it's from the technical summary, it's looking at CIDs across different regions, they were really interested in these kinds of changes. And in part of the review, they said, we want to know more about like storms and extreme like cyclones and these kinds of things. And we're like, ah, oh, we have a figure about that in one of the chapters. Um, so we put in this one halfway through because they were particularly interested in this, um, this, this phenomena. So it's a, a sort of wide range of tables and figures that were useful for, the, for these audiences. And then when it came, oh yeah, uh, sorry, just um, in terms of other types of information, actuaries are very like data-driven and they were really interested in, uh, in products like the Interactive Atlas and being giving access to the data. And so we ended up including um, a lot of information about how you can access data. We gave them a guide of like how to use the Interactive Atlas, um, but particularly because that was something they were interested of. Usually this uh, figure goes around and you can see the data, but it's frozen, so not today. And then when it comes to the summary for all, you know, giving these kinds of information to someone who's not a non-scientist may not be the best way for them to have take home messages from, from climate change. Um, and so we try to, to balance the figures a bit more. Um, we, in the working group one, we have this series of frequently asked questions you can get on the website. And so we use, and these are much more about, they're more educational about giving overviews of what's happening, what's changing, and it's explaining why a lot more than just giving like core numerical results. And so we ended up using a lot of the frequently asked question figures in this because it helped educate and um, explain why things are happening, not just this, this is happening by how much. And then we also complemented that with, um, you will have seen some of these cartoons from Catherine's talk yesterday where we try to be a bit more <laughs> sorry monday i'm going to meet you again do you have a do you have a question okay um yeah we then tried to complement it with some uh with some cartoons that were drawn by catherine Leitzel, who gave a presentation yesterday and you'll see some of the similar um similar uh, cartoons that she was showing as well um, and it's not just to be a little bit light-hearted and it's trying to be a bit engaging but it's also trying to show a bit of a message so this is showing this cat wants to go into the future and see what the world's going to be like so he's found himself a time machine that's that's great he's like i want to go to 2020 50 uh, 2050 please and then the scientist cat's going well which 2050 is going to depend on the options that you're choosing right it depends on the actions that we do now and in the coming decades so you can't just go to 2050, 2050, it depends on what you want to do now. So that was the idea behind that. Um, and then actually this comes from the, a, a question earlier that was about translations. Um, we've been very fortunate enough to have some volunteers to translate this summary into many different languages because it's shorter and because it's a bit more clearly or simply written and a, um, it's a bit more easy to uh, understand language. Um, it's been translated into uh, eight languages so far, um, and so including Arabic, Chinese, we've got Spanish, French. Um, we also have Hindi and Bengali, the first drafts have just come through, but that's um, not out uploaded yet. Um, and we're really hoping this will then help <laughs> to, uh, to, to educate and get more people interested in, in understanding some of the key facts of, of, of climate change. Um, we might get Ukrainian and we also might get South Korean. If anyone else speaks other languages and you want to help translate, you're very welcome to contact me. Um, I think it would be really useful if we could get um, many, many, as many languages as possible. Um, oh, and that's it. <laughs> um, if you want to actually read them, you can go on the IPCC website, go on like the resources tab 
and um and then you can you can download them and see them but uh yeah thank you very much for having me uh yeah do, do you, if you have any questions we, i guess um otherwise i can do the other thing um just a quick comment since you showed the languages first of all it's super impressive i didn't know it was all the way up to eight languages but two more coming um, when we wrote up our climatic impact drivers paper, one fun thing we did is we we used the IPCC team and asked everybody to define that term in their own language, um, because it's a very subtle and kind of technical term. Um, I don't have the table right in front of me, but you know, if if you're French, the person who wrote that is Robert Votard. He's coming tonight, so you can ask him about how he talks about climatic impact drivers in French, um, and. We tried at one point to put like a basic English retranslation, like, you know, you put something into Google Translate and then you bring it back and you learn things about how the language is constructed. And it is interesting to see how people have have approached it in, in different places in terms of emphasizing, you know, impact, emphasizing climatic, uh, you know, touch points or whatever it might be. So, uh, yeah, that process of, of translation is far too often overlooked uh, and a good translation really, really helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Any more questions? Oh, is there any time? Oh, God, there's 10. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, someone is uh, offering for Turkish. That'd be great. Uh, we can email later. <laughs> um, Okay, Monday, I'll, I'll reply to you in the chat after. Um, <laughs> um, so I, yeah, that'd be great. Now, if, if anyone is um, interested in helping with translations, just let me know. The only thing is we might need to have um, a couple of the authors that also speak that language because we have to get it checked by, by the scientists as well. Um, but yeah, it would be good. Um, Okay, so maybe we close and then I can just do a couple of things about how to be an author. But I don't, I, maybe Siggy and Camilla don't need to. Okay. Okay, so I'll just show you now. So to become an IPCC author, um, it's, it's quite a structured process. Um, and so essentially you need to be nominated. You have to put forward your application through um, the uh, either your country's focal point. And so you can find your country's focal point on the IPCC website. So uh, this is, I'll just show you. Um, uh, so if you, okay, so just type in focal point. I like the contact point, like where, any uh, information that the IPCC wants to send out, we have this contact point, the focal point, and then they're supposed to disseminate it through their networks in their country. So you can find them e easily by Googling, and then you can go and it says, for a full list available, then you can click and it will give the country, uh, the, the name, and then a contact information. Almost, almost certainly there is an email. Uh, I think there's always an email. Um, and so, there will um, there will be a call for nominations, author nominations for a specific report, and then there'll be a deadline where country focal points have to submit um, a list of authors that they nominate, and then it gets they get selected by the IPCC bureau. Um, another way of being nominated, just in case if your focal point is not so responsive or um, you worry they might not select you for whatever reason. Um, you can also get nominated through observer organizations. Um, and then if you click on the tab here, you can find there's, there's hundreds of observer organizations. And so if you know one that's like maybe more local to your region or uh, you have contacts with, then you can maybe get nominated through, through them as well. Um, and then in terms of timing, uh, the IPCC AR6 is basically coming to an end in, at the end of July. Um, the new AR7 will start um, basically at the end of July, um, and they will have a meeting to, a, to, um, to design which, which reports they will do for the next cycle at the end of this year. 
And once that gets published on the IPCC website, you'll know more about the timeline of what reports are going to happen, when they're going to happen. And so from that timeline, you'll know, OK, authors are going to be selected roughly this these months. And so then you'll see a call for nominations. And that's when you know it's time to try and get yourselves nominated. Um, but yeah, some some countries don't do any filtering process. They'll just be like, oh, you've applied. We'll, we'll just submit your application. Other countries do um, filtering processes. You don't actually know if you get uh, submitted or not, but it's up to the individual country. Um, yeah. I hope I didn't miss you uh, saying this, but a um, couple of the things, you know, there's going to be elections for the IPCC uh, mm -hmm. AR7 leaders around that same July timeframe. So there's a lot kind of waiting for the elections to happen. That will be the highest level of IPCC chair and the secretariat and all, or at the, or the, um, the vice chairs and things like that. But then also the working groups and one of their earliest tasks is going to be to lay out whether and how many special reports there might be in addition to the working groups, or if there's some radical restructuring coming on, we will love, we will know then. But usually when you're nominated, you're not nominated for IPCC broadly, you're nominated for a specific report or a specific named role that would, would be elected. Um, so if, if you're trying to get nominated for one of those very high roles, uh, you probably already needed to talk to your country, but as an author team, uh, you know, when you hear that a special report is announced, that's when there might be calls for, for author submissions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you when you submit, you sort of say, "Oh, I'd really like to be for this report. I, I would like to be on chapter one or something." Because you'll have like an outline of the report, and so you can you nominate to a specific chapter, and then you can say, "Do I want to be a coordinating lead author?" Which is like the there's like only two or three of them per chapter, and they're like the big coordinators. It's a huge amount of responsibility. Alex can tell you. <laughs> um, or you can be a lead author, which is more inv involved with like coordinating just a section of a chapter um, and other and some other things as well. But um, yeah, so it's, it's different different um, roles you can apply for as well. There's also review editors where you don't actually write the report; you get involved with looking at the review comments and helping the chapter with responding to that as well. Um, but they'll basically when it, when there's a call, you'll you'll get this form and you have to fill it out and show your publications and your expertise. And, these kinds of issues. Also, if you have um, more than one nationality, um, some countries uh, get loads and loads of nominations and other countries don't. Like if you're from Europe, there's always so many um, nominations from Europe. But if you have another nationality, like, I don't know, from a different region, it's good to be submitted either through both of them or, or from the, the less represented uh, country because it's, it actually helps your, uh, improve your chances because we have to have a good regional diversity diversity and regional balance and across the regions of, uh, of for all the authors um because you know it, no one's going to listen to a report if it's going to be written by all by like american men <laughs> like the report has to be written by people from all over the world and represent and have make sure it's uh, it's more strong and more robust then so um yeah so that's one of the reasons but, Maybe it would be interesting, Sarah, to also say something about the TSU role, don't you think? Oh, yeah, you want. <laughs> no, I thought it could be interesting. We talk about the communication. We talk, so maybe being involved is not just the author or the daughter. I mean, there is a huge amount of roles also in the TSU. So I was just TSU. thinking maybe it could be interesting to know more. Yeah, yeah. I would be interested to know more. Yeah. I don't know much. Well, um, in terms of the, the, the TSU, um, so Alex was talking about there's going to be elections for the, the, we call them the Bureau, but they're like the sign. Oh. What is TSU? What is TSU? Technical Support Unit. It's uh, where Nada and I work and Catherine and, um, and Lena. And so they are the technical support to help produce. Uh, they normally support a working group. And so, yeah, Alex was saying that they have these elections of the Bureau, which are like the scientific steering committee at the beginning of every cycle. And um, there's always a, a, um, an author, like a, for the work for each working group, they have two co-chairs. Uh, there's always one that's from a developed country and there's always one from a developing country. And the developed country co-chair has to um, provide fun funding for the technical support unit. So it's always in the place where the developed country co-chair is located. And that's why it always stops at the end of a cycle because the co-chair changes and then it can move to a different place afterwards. Um, and so these, these are contracts that 
run, you know, it can be a couple of years, it can be eight years you're working there. And there's a variety of different roles. There's like a normally a science side where you're helping um, like project manage and, and do a lot of checking of the of the of the reports. You're helping to design the, the process of the of the chapters. Um, of, the, of the of the entire report, you're you're, you're doing a lot of oversight of, um, of of issues across the report and helping to think about how you're going to build up messages for the summary for policymakers. It's a really interesting role. <laughs> it's quite busy. Um, there's an operations side where you're like doing the more logistical side of setting up the meetings, uh, making sure everything's going to run smoothly. Um, and there's also like a sort of communications outreach side, which um, which is about yeah these developing these fact sheets, working with authors on media training, working with authors on developing their key messages, um, yeah, all kinds of of roles there. So I've been working here in the technical support unit for about six and a half years. It's always it's normally short term contracts, but it is the only role in the IPCC where you are actually paid for the work. All the authors of <laughs> which is mad, but um. <laughs> But yeah, all the other authors and, and everyone else, the Bureau, they're all doing this voluntarily. Um, yeah, you don't get, you'll get your travel um, provided for you to, to go to IPCC meetings, but you never get actually a wage to be involved with the IPCC unless you're in the, the TSU and the, and the Secretariat, because we're, we're full-time staff. Um, yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Maybe we finish now, or any other questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I think that brings us to a close this afternoon. Um, and uh, in that sense, I think we're, we're free to go. And we'll be back here tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. And who's closer to the agenda and can tell me what, what we will be focusing on? I think it's health, right? Health, I believe, is next. So um, yep. Enjoy your evening. It's, it's beautiful out and, uh, we'll be back tomorrow morning. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Nada. <laughs>